Well, this is going to be a video going over the model steam engine that I've built here. This is my first time building a model steam engine, and uh, it's something I've wanted to do for quite some time. Been machining for about a year and a half now, cut my teeth in the precision spinning top community, and I wanted to try something a little bit more challenging than a spinning top. So this video is going to chronicle the building of my very first model steam engine. I didn't take a lot of video throughout the process, but I did take a lot of photos. So let's get right into it and we'll talk about the base. Now one idea I had for the base is to use this piece of segmented copper and stainless steel. Uh, it's kind of an ode to wood turning, segmented wood turning, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to try to bring that into um, metalworking. And here we have a piece of Dymalux walnut and aluminum, and I knew the base was going to be pretty light, so there's a piece of tungsten that I embedded in the bottom there. And we're building up the base here. And now the stem, I thought it'd be fun to laminate some pieces of copper uh, in with the Damascus stem there, so we'd have kind of a pattern. And this is the process I used to laminate those patterns. I put it in the the arbor or the hydraulic press to press it all together and I had a really nice fit on the bottom section there. Now here I'm building the top section and I laminated in two more pieces of copper. I didn't get quite as good of a fit on those but it's all a learning process for me. And uh, you can see the base is turning out really nice. Uh, I'm very happy with, with how that wood looks down in there. So here we are decking off the surface that the cylinder is going to ride against and I used some uh, brass bushings to go through for the crank pin and the uh, the rotating assembly for the for the cylinder. Now we have that milled flat. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is actually etch the Damascus. So we're using nail polish to mask off the surfaces that we don't want to etch. And here you can see it's fully masked. Even the copper laminations there. We're etching in ferric chloride and vinegar. I uh, get a nice dark etch in there. Uh, have it just soaking. I think I soaked it for 25 minutes. I have a pretty good etch. And then there's a little knife making trick to soak it in some fresh coffee. And that will darken the etch. And here's the final product. Uh, looking pretty nice. I have a, a really beautiful etch on the Twist Damascus. And uh, the pieces that we didn't want etched aren't etched. Now when I started this project, I knew the flywheel was going to be one of the more complicated pieces and I wanted to use an edge banded Timascus sandwiched with two pieces of tungsten there on kind of a three piece uh, flywheel. And there's the Timascus edge pattern. Now we're going to tripan out a piece because this is a very expensive piece of Timascus. And uh, I went ahead and ground a trepanning tool out of high speed steel and it cut really nice actually. I didn't have any issue with it. Uh, becoming too dull or anything. I did stop every now and then and resharpen it. And of course I didn't actually go all the way through on the trepanning process here otherwise the the extra piece would have flew off and hit me in the face or something. So I did stop it and uh, I ended up just breaking off uh, the outer section there once it was once it was close. And once it's turned down to final OD uh, I needed a way to hold it in the rotary table so we could perform some more work on the intersection of that. So I took a chunk of aluminum and made a little mortise in it and made a fixture to hold that. And I just secured it in there with some um, Loctite 603, which is kind of a retaining compound and it's easy to break with just a little bit of gentle heat. And here we're seeing a series of photos that are showing the phases of rotor table work that I, that I used to create the lugs in the Timascus there uh, that will hook to the hub part of the flywheel itself. And I was pretty happy with how these lugs turned out. You know, that's that's one piece of really expensive Timascus in there. And to get those hubs formed in there, I was really proud of that rotary table work. So just a little bit of heat, pop that out. And we put a little indent on either side. That's where the, uh, the tungsten is actually going to press into either side of that. Um, with some interference fits in there. And that's where the mass of the flywheel is going to come from. Timascus is just two grades of titanium uh, forge welded together, so I knew it was going to be pretty light. So I wanted to make sure to heavy it up with some tungsten. So here we're actually going to start working on the hub assembly itself. Um, 
I, I found that these aluminum fixtures were, were really helpful and I used them a lot in the process. And here's some more rotary table work. I needed to tap a 080, a series of 080 screws. And I found this pin vise that goes all the way through. It's a, it's a, it's a through pin vise. And I used a piece of 01 drill rod in the mill there as a mandrel and I could run the pin vise on that and get this uh, get this tapped in there. Well this was my first time using such a very small tap. Like I said this was a 080 tap. I was really nervous about it but the reality is it worked pretty well with that uh, tapping fixture uh, using the, the pin vise like that. I didn't have any problem getting through there and of course this is rotary table work so we're going to um, tap one hole and then rotate it uh, and tap the other four holes in there because it's a five five bolt pattern. Now I don't think I mentioned it but this is a bronze hub assembly that we're building and the test fit uh, worked the first time which is really pretty proud of and those little brass screws went in there no problem. So here I made a tiny little uh, compass centering pin which dropped down into the main pivot hole of the of the bronze hub there and it allowed me to mark the location for the spokes that I'm about to make and I think I used a quarter inch end mill to cut those uh, spoke cutouts and get the hub fully formed here. Now at this point, this was all pretty rough stuff here. Still needed lots of filing and polishing uh, to smooth it all out. And picked up a new set of Swiss files, which wow, they worked so well. And hours and hours and hours of sanding with very fine paper, and we finally got a really nice finish on both the bronze hub and the Timascus ring there. I think I have some videos showing uh, the smooth finish I got on a Timascus. It's really important to have a very smooth finish on a Timascus because when we go to flame polish it, any scratches in there are going to are going to be seen in the in the color that uh, the titanium um, changes to as we flame it. So it's really important to get a very smooth finish there. And the bronze also had a really nice surface finish. Of course it's the result of hours upon hours of sitting there with 3000 grit sandpapers going at it. But it looked really nice in the end and I was really pleased with how it turned out. And now we have a very heavy chunk of tungsten that we're going to do something with. Uh, the the Tidemascus ring there is 6.28 ounces and 15.81 on the one side of the tungsten. So the tungsten was definitely going to add a lot of mass to the flywheel and that was always the intention. We have some more aluminum fixtures here and pulling everything in place with some hot snot glue so we could turn the back side of the bronze hub down to final dimension. I wanted to do that while the whole flywheel was assembled. That way I could bore the center bore of the flywheel concentric with the outside of the flywheel itself. And that way it wouldn't shake around as it's rotating. Since it was an assembly of you know uh, four five different pieces, uh, it made sense to bore that center axle um, as a full unit to make sure it was all in line. Well, the flywheel was a lot of work, but I'm really pleased with how it turned out. It's a nice centerpiece for the engine and really highlights some of the skill that I, I particularly wanted to show off with this build. Okay, on to the retaining nut. This one kind of makes me laugh a little bit. I didn't really have a plan with this, but I started making it and I thought, well, why not go a little bit overboard? I put all those copper laminations in the main body of the engine. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to replicate that here in the nut. That way it's not just a basic piece of metal, it's something interesting to look at. And then of course I went even further and I thought it'd be cool to inlay a piece of Timascus in the end of the nut there. And you can see that it's been flamed here and you can see the pattern in there. Now the nut has a dual bore, one bore to accept the axle and then a little bit wider bore to capture the spring in there. It also has a pretty well formed knurl. Not my best knurl, but I've also never knurled across three pieces of metal like that, and I think it turned out okay. 
okay, onto the cylinder. This one had me just a little bit nervous because I needed to tap a relatively small hole into this Timascus, and I wasn't so sure about tapping titanium, but I bought a titanium specific tap and some proper Molly D uh, cutting fluid and got that hole in there no problem. Now one thing that had me really excited about building the cylinder is all the off-center work that I would need to do in a forge jaw. I hadn't done this before and I also didn't have this tool. This is a knockoff of a Sterrett number 65 lathe center tester finder and it's a long pole with two hardened pointers on either side. Uh, the chuck side there goes into um, a, a center punch divot and then the post sticks out oh, a good 10 inches and so any off-centerness is amplified. You can see we have a little bit of wobble here but over the course of the 12 inch tool itself we're talking in the tenths of accuracy so I was really happy with that and I thought it was really cool to use this new tool. The cylinder bore was actually bored out but there's a lot of wear in the ways of this lathe and so I bought a reamer set and was able to ream that cylinder bore uh, exactly circular. And then I used a little bit of metal polish, uh, some diamond lapping paste would have been better but the metal polish seemed to work okay in order to lap the piston to the cylinder and we had a nice little pop. Now once that was done, I reversed the cylinder in the chuck and was able to cut this top side feature that I wanted to kind of look like a cylinder head on there. Now in order to finish off that cylinder head portion, I made this little aluminum jig which centered the cylinder head portion on the center line of the fixture which is actually offset from the center line of the cylinder itself. And then I could mount it in the rotary table and mill out these little pockets which is where you'd have a, like a, a bolt or a rivet or something like that. Now I did actually buy some rivets to put down in there, but they're 21 thousandths OD. And to be honest, I kind of chickened out on drilling 21 thousandths hole into that Timascus and ended up scrapping the part. But I'm pretty happy with the illusion and I think it worked out just fine. So next up we have the piston and connecting rod. The piston isn't anything too special, it's just a piece of stainless that matches the cylinder bore. The connecting rod was kind of interesting. I started with some flat stock and then I turned it down in a collet here and put a one degree taper on it. Uh, and then I milled that taper flat on two sides and was able to put in some interesting features to kind of make it look like a H beam connecting rod like you might find in a race car or something like that um, but then i wanted to mill a 180 degree radius on the end of it so i created this little aluminum fixture that the connecting rod would hold, would mount into and then the fixture would go right back onto the rotary table which i used a lot in this project in order to mill the lower side of the connecting rod into a radius this project required a lot of fixturing and clever or interesting solutions of, of mounting stuff and I thought that was a lot of fun to deal with those challenges of work holding. The last major piece to build was the crank. Now I tried to do a lot of math and computation in this to balance out the rotating mass of the connecting rod and piston and the upper side of the crank and pin uh, to match the lower side of the crank and uh, my calculations told me I needed to add about six grams of mass on the lower side of the crank. So we took our piece of, of Damascus steel here, this is pinstripe Damascus, and I milled out a little pocket, and here I'm creating a, a small key of tungsten that's going to fit down in that piece there. And the math on that seemed to be pretty close actually. Uh, I think it was within a gram or two of being balanced. And I just used some Loctite 648 to hold that in place. Um, so then once that was all together, I made another little fixture in the rotary table here. I was able to cut that, uh, that crank into a, a pleasant shape and got a little thin on the sides there, but overall it seems to be holding just fine and um, I think it turned out pretty cool. Now I used a piece of mosaic pin as the actual connecting rod pin 
Uh, you know, the idea here is that everywhere you look on this engine, you see a, an interesting little detail that, that pops out, and that pin uh, just creates one more place for there to be something interesting to look at. Finally, on to the last aspect of the build. Uh, now here I am marking the intake and exhaust ports. I just used a little pin. This is a, a method I saw in Tubalcane and his single acting engines. Put a little pin in that cylinder and scribe the actual arc onto the body of the of the base there and that uh, located the intake and exhaust ports. And then I decided I wanted to create this little flange uh, area for the intake pipe that would be mounted onto the base of the engine there and held in with a tiny little uh, 080 screw. So here I am creating the brass flange and that's going to be silver soldered onto the intake pipe itself. And you can see it's screwed into that location. And I think that's a pretty cool little detail. Um, it was fun to make and uh, it was challenging to do the silver soldering because that's not something I had done before. And I did find that the pipe, the intake pipe was kind of long and needed a little bit more support. So here I am doing my very first silver soldering on a bracket that's going to go at the bottom of the base. And I was so pleased at how this turned out. Like I said, this is my very first time successfully silver soldering. I'd tried in the past and I've never had a lot of success with it. So uh, getting the right flux was the key for me. I had okay silver solder, but the flux was the issue. And here you can see at the bottom of the model here is where that bracket's gonna go. And I milled out a flat there so that I would have a locating uh, boss for a little 080 screw to, to uh, mount in there. Now jumping ahead a little here to show the actual final intake pipe, but the idea is to show you that the two brackets are there. Now I never expected the intake and exhaust piping to be one of the more difficult parts of this project, but in fact they were. I found to get prototypically correct bends in the copper piping, I would just kink it and I tried like five different methods with sand or water or ice or even uh, low temp metal uh, to fill that copper tubing and get the bend in there. And I just couldn't get it without getting kinks. So I ended up creating my own tubing bender here with really small radius dies in there. And with that, I was able to get, finally, after many attempts, I was able to get a really nice consistent pipe with no kinks at all in the tubing. And here we go. All the parts are there. Uh, the last thing I had is a little stainless muffler that I put on there and gave it a little flame job on the, on the tip just for the fun of it. And that completes the engine. Uh, it was a lot of work, but it was really rewarding, and it was a project I've wanted to do for a long time. Here you can see it running on 3 PSI compressed air. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.